Hey guys, Brian from Brian Bowes here. I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys lately, so thank you and keep the questions coming. Today I thought I'd take a few minutes and answer some of the questions. And I picked these questions because I think that the answers of them are useful to pretty much anybody who watches this channel. So to start with, first question, and I've been getting a lot of questions like this lately. It seems like you're posting new videos much less frequently than before. Why is this and what is the future of your channel? Okay, so that's kind of the million dollar question there. Yes, I have been posting fewer videos. When I started this channel around three years ago, I was initially posting three times a week and I kept that up for probably a year and a half, maybe even two years. And it was just a little bit too much. Then I went back to about twice a week, two videos a week, occasionally three or even four videos a week. And then lately it's just been kind of more, I post the videos when I have a topic to present on. And so it became aware to me pretty uh, soon after I started doing this, there's only a certain number of topics on any subject that you can present on. And with something like this channel, which is pretty much devoted exclusively to BOAS, you just can't keep coming up with new more and more topics and I'm kind of amazed at the number of topics that I came up with and that I came up with with the help of suggestions from people like you who watch the channel but ultimately I kind of ran out of topics and then you know I was kind of doing the same thing just in a little bit different of a way um, which was okay but it kind of got old after a while um, and then, you know, the other issue is that lately I just haven't really had the time. I'm, as you might know, I work a full-time job unrelated to BOAS, and that's been really busy lately. Also, I've had a lot of baby BOAS that I've had, you know, in the last few months that I've had to put into time to take care of. So my time is really divided among multiple things, and sometimes I just don't have the time to make the videos. And then I have to be uh, honest, I have to say that sometimes I just don't have the motivation. It just this is kind of really easy to get burnt out doing this. And I've seen many YouTube channels, they just keep cranking out videos every day, sometimes even two or three a day. And they're just the same thing. It's like the person is just saying the same thing again and again and again, the same hype, the same BS, and it just gets really old. So some of those channels that I used to watch on a variety of topics, I'd watch like a few episodes, subscribe, and then it was just, you know, just got kind of really old. So I don't want my channel to get old. Get old. I don't want to get burnt out. There's only a certain number of topics, uh, and I have a limited amount of bandwidth both in terms of time and motivation. Uh, as far as the future of the channel, I'm not exactly sure. This is probably enough to talk about for a full episode, but I'll say I'm not giving up the channel. I'm continuing to, I plan to continue to post these videos on a regular basis when I have something important to say. And that's really the, what I need is I want to present a video that I'm not making just for the sake of making a video. I really want to have a message, something to share, something I'm excited about. I don't want to just make a video to go through the motions. So that in mind, I do have topics I'd like to get to eventually, uh, you know, and um, hopefully I should be able to keep presenting these videos at least once, if not twice, or even more often per week. So please stay tuned and I really appreciate your feedback and all your help you know your comments are really what keeps me motivated the positive comments so i thank all of you loyal viewers who've been supporting my channel over the years okay kind of a long-winded answer next question doesn't a boa's behavior depend on the human and this was a video on boa handling and behavior if you leave it in the cage and just toss in a mouse once in a while, it might be a jerk if you decide to hold it one day. Yes, it's certainly true. You know, your boa's behavior has a lot to do with the handler. Okay, if you take your boa out regularly, give it some attention, and you know, assuming it's not a really nervous boa and doesn't mind being handled, it's going to get it used to handling and it's going to get tame over time. Um, if you have a situation where you're just throwing food in there, every once in a while, you're gonna condition your boa to expect food every time you open the cage, and you're gonna maybe try to hold it one day and it's gonna think food is coming and it's gonna probably bite you. So not a good thing to do. So if you want a boa that's a pet that you can handle, you typically you should plan on holding it at least once or twice a week, you know, just so that it gets accustomed to the humans. 
Boas also can read people's behavior and you know the same boa and two different handlers will behave completely differently. If you have someone that's not secure and is nervous and is you know jumpy, the boa can sense the fear and it's likely to react um, you know in a more hostile or more uncomfortable way. If a person is used to holding boas and they know how to handle them, typically the boa is much more likely to be relaxed. So of course the person's temperament and personality has a lot to do with the boa's temperament and personality. Okay, what does call mean when it comes to boas? By call, K-A-H-L. So call is a strain of albino. Uh, it was founded by the breeder Peter Call, spelled K-A-H-L, way back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, you know, one of the first morphs in boa constrictors, you know, very important morph. Many of you people, including myself, have these beautiful call albinos in our collection. And call is probably the main strain of albino boa. It's called T negative or tyrosinase negative. And this distinguishes it from the T positive or tyrosinase positive boas, like the VPI and several other strains. The VPI or the T positive boas have kind of more of a caramel appearance. They're not quite the same level of interruption of the melanin pigment as the T negative albinos, which have more of an orange and yellow appearance. And there's actually one other strain of T negative albino called the Sharp strain, which was founded by Brian Sharp. And these look similar to the calls. Some people claim that they're a little bit more colorful or the color doesn't fade as much. But I think this has a lot to do also with the genetic background that the particular gene is on. Uh, and that maybe in the sharps, they just had this predisposition to retain their color a little bit longer. But the call and sharp albinos are not compatible. You can't breed a sharp to a call and get albinos. In fact, you shouldn't do that because what you'll get is you'll get hats for both call and sharp. And then if you breed them together, you'll get sharps and, and calls and some will be double for sharps, double or double for call and sharp. Some will be like call head sharp. Some will be sharp head call. It's just really super confusing. Um, so it's not recommended that you breed a call and a sharp. But the call is a great morph to work with. A lot of people like them. They've been around a long time, so the prices have gone down. You can make combos like sun glows and jung glows and snows and moon glows with the call. Um, just a you know, great boa morph to be working with if you're into the boa morphs. Okay, uh, question number four. What kind of hide would you use for a seven foot plus female? Okay, so with hides, you're basically limited only by your imagination. If you have an I, um, object or structure that the snake can get in and it can be walled off from its other surroundings, that can be a good hide. So pretty much any box-like uh, object can be converted to a hide. And I've talked before about using things like cat litter pans and large opaque tubs. You can basically just cut or melt a door and the snake can get in there. Of course, you can also use a more naturalistic option like a cork bark tube. The cork bark tubes do come in very large sizes up to like two feet in diameter and you know several feet long and while those are really expensive they make great hides for the larger boas. You can also make your own hide out of wood if you find a large tree trunk and hollow it out something like that. You want to make sure that you clean it pretty well before you put it into your boas enclosure but typically it's okay to use wood and other um, natural items that you bring from outside, provided you make sure they're clean. You're not going to spread mites or parasites from the external environment to your bow. I've seen people worry about that, but that's typically not something you have to worry about. But again, the you know your options for hides are limited by your imagination. If any of you guys out there have any suggestions for what you've used for a large hide or even a smaller hide, please comment below. Thought I'd grab another snake. This is my male uh, Argentine boa. This guy is a Max Pink Bloodline who had his first litter just a few weeks ago. Okay, next question. Hi Brian, is it common, normal, and healthy for older male boa and parators to grow over six feet? I've heard from some breeders in the UK that no male should be six feet in length 
You've shown in this video two males over six feet and both look very healthy and muscular. So as you know, if you've been following the channel, questions about boa size and misunderstandings about this topic are one of the most frequent things I talk about. Frequently people think boas are giants and they're all like 10 to 12, even up to 18 feet long, which of course is pretty much untrue. And this is kind of a difference because we're the, the talking about thinking that a boa doesn't get over six feet. No, that's just not true. Boa imperators can get rarely up to 10 or even 11, 12 feet long. The vast majority of animals, particularly the males, are gonna be somewhere in the five to seven foot range. And this includes things like Colombian boas, uh, different morph boas, hog island boas, and other animals that fall under the species imperator. But they certainly can get quite a bit bigger than that, and some will. There are probably some breeders out there that try to deliberately stunt their boas, particularly the males, so they don't have to put them in larger cages or maybe they can feed them less. I would strongly recommend against this. You want to let your boa grow to whatever size is going to be natural for it as dictated by its genetics. You don't want to power feed, but you certainly don't want to stunt them by underfeeding them either. The best breeders are, of course, ones which have been allowed to get to their size that you know would be dictated by their genes okay so this guy's kind of being active today brian curious what would be a minimum weight you would breed your females or maybe a better question what is an average weight of your breeding females okay so i can't answer that question because i don't regularly weigh my females i know people in ball pythons do this and they've got some magic formula you know, when it hits a thousand grams, they wanna start pumping out the babies or the eggs. But with boas, I don't really weigh them on a regular basis. Some I weigh, but I don't keep track of the weights on a regular basis. Um, the way that I determine if a female is ready to breed is by her body condition and her age. Typically, most females are gonna be at least four, if not five years old before they're ready to breed. In some cases, it could be even be six years old. And the females should have a very muscular body. They should have a kind of more of a square body, especially for the true red tails. Um, the females typically have not bred the previous year. You, so it's, uh, you want to give the females a year off in between breeding in order to put the weight back on. And you don't want a female that's going to be too overweight either. So it's not really a weight thing. It's more of a body condition and age. Um, with the boas. I'm sure that you know you could weigh them and get some kind of idea that way but to me it's easier just to look at their body condition to determine if they're ready to breed or not. Okay this next question was asked about radiant heat panels and in reference to these radiant heat panels they ask is it also a good idea to also put a heat pad at the bottom of the enclosure with the radiant heat panel to get an optimal temperature from below at the hot side of the enclosure using both heat sources in conjunction or is it advisable to use only one or the, of the two either the radiant heat panel or the heat pad slash heat mat slash heat tape well this depends on your particular situation so typically i only use one i either use a you know, heat mat or heat tape on about a third of the enclosure from beneath, or I use a radiant heat panel, you know, covering about one quarter of the enclosure from above. And this is gonna depend on the size of the enclosure and your ambient temperatures in the room. So if you have a relatively high ambient temperature that's typically at least around 75 or so, Typically, you can use just one heat source. And for me, it's a lot easier and more efficient to use heat from underneath with either ultratherm heat mats or um, flex watt heat tape, things like that. And I have a lot of animals, and because of all of these heating mats, it actually increases the ambient temperature of the snake room by a few degrees. I also live in a relatively temperate climate. We have very you know, warm winters here in California, so I don't have to worry about, you know, really cold temperatures. If you have like a cold temperature, if you live in somewhere cold, it might make more sense to use a radiant heat panel because that does a better job heating the ambient temperature in your enclosure. The heat tapes and heat mats create a hot spot. Um, 
and but they don't really do a great job of heating the entire ambient temperature although they do raise the ambient temperature within the enclosure by a few degrees you know in contrast to what some people claim so for me it's typically works better to have the room temperature in my in my snake room is about 75 to 80. I'll set the heat mat so that it maintains about 88 to 90 degrees and the cool side of the enclosure will work out to be somewhere in the typically 78 to 80 degree range. So it's perfect temperatures for boas. I do have some larger cages that I use the radiant heat panels in just because it does a better job of providing ambient temperatures in those larger enclosures. Okay, next question, and this is really more of a comment. Uh, energy prices are up. It costs more for breeders to heat the parent snakes, so the price of babies is going up. $60 baby common boas are history. I just paid $125 for a baby boa at a reptile show. Frozen mice are like $4 at a pet store. Pet mice are over $10. Pet rats are like $20. Ferrets used to be $70. Last week I saw ferrets for $300. And fifty dollars, and this was in reference to a question about the prices of boas. And yes, unfortunately, everything is going up. One of the things that, that hits me the most is electricity costs. So here in California, it's absolutely insane the amount that they're charging for electricity. Um, yeah, don't I don't even want to get started on that. But you know, the prices of rodents has gone up too quite a bit in the in the last few years. But I'm paying almost as much in electricity as I am in rodents for my boas to keep my collection going. Uh, so, you know, that's going to affect the cost of baby boas. It's just everything is getting more and more expensive. Or really, it's the dollar is getting less and less valuable the more that inflation happens. And, you know, we heard about inflation a lot for a very long time. And then lately they're claiming that it's, you know, inflation isn't as bad as it was. But you know, these people obviously have never been to a grocery store. I've been shocked by the prices of some items in grocery stores uh, lately. I mean, it's scary. I don't know how people can survive with uh, the, uh, the expenses of just basic groceries and things like that. So I don't think inflation is over. Uh, I think that the, this is just uh, a new norm that we have to live with. Um, and you know, the government doesn't want to talk about it as much because it looks bad for the politicians but they've just made the problem worse and um, you know, ordinary people like us just have to deal with it. Thought I'd grab another snake. Here's a nice Prometheus Bloodline Suriname, born back in 2016, now a proven breeder. One of my favorite Surinams that I've produced. Okay, next question. Do you notice that babies sell better than one-year-olds or two-year-olds? What happens to your demand Generally speaking, as your boas age. So in general, they become more in demand as they age because they're closer to breeding size. And typically I sell most of my boas as babies. So they're usually minimum about two to three months of age, up to about a year. And a lot of people think this is a great time to get a boa because they can handle it and it's still young and they can watch it grow, things like that. And that's certainly true. Some people prefer a boa that's slightly older. In the cases of the true red tails and some other boas that might be a little bit hard to get established, uh, I, you know, a one or two year old boa might be a little bit healthier and more, more robust than a boa that's under a year old. But typically it's not that big of a concern. But then when a boa gets to be about you know, three or four years old and it's almost the age that it can be bred, the value would go up quite a bit. In fact, there's very few people who are gonna deliberately grow boas to breeding size and then sell them because they put in a huge amount of investment and time and money to raise the boas up. And you know, at that point, they're, you know, the plan is to breed them. So um, in general, the older boas are more valuable and they have higher prices than the younger boas. And in some cases, you can find people that are getting out of the hobby. They have a lot of boas and for whatever reason, they have to find new homes for them. And in some cases, you can get a, you know, a good deal on an adult boa that's ready to breed. But this is few and far between. And you know, most of the time, 
you're gonna be a lot more likely to get baby boas. A lot of people don't have the patience to grow a boa for you know, four or five years to get it to breeding size. But you know, if you're new to boas, just enjoy the ride, enjoy the experience. Don't be in a hurry to breed. Um, you know, the time flies and your boa soon enough will be of the size to breed if you decide to go down that route. Okay. What baby boas will you have available this year and when will they be ready? Well, if you've been following the channel, you know I've had a number of really nice litters so far this year. Right now, I'm, I'm getting the babies established, feeding them, getting them ready to go. I, you know, at a minimum, I, my, my baby boas need to have fed voluntarily at least three or four times before they're ready to go. And I just wanna make sure they don't have any health issues. So they're typically at a minimum about a month and a half to two months old when they're ready to go. And so I've had so far litters of true red tails, both from Peru and Suriname, VPIT positive albinos, Hog Island, Pearl Island. And my most recent litter was a litter of Argentine boas. And so many of these animals are almost established and I'm going to list them on my Flickr page soon. Um, all except for the Argentines, which were born recently, have most of the animals have already fed several times and they're doing really well. So my goal is to probably have the initial group of animals up, let's say by the end of the month on my Flickr page with prices and they'll be ready to go. And of course I'll have a video ahead of time announcing and showing you some of the available babies. So please be sure to stay tuned to that, tuned for that video if you're interested in possibly picking up a really nice locality boa. Next question, how big is Brian? Because he makes every boa look like a corn snake. Well, I'm pretty much normal average size for an adult male, about 5'11", you know, normal height and weight, or my weight is pretty much proportionate for my height. So it's not because my size is dwarfing the boas. Most of my boas are just not all that big. And you know, boas in general, there's this misconception about how big they are. The vast majority of my adult boas are somewhere in the six to eight foot range for the larger ones. I have many dwarf boas that are somewhere in the four to five foot range on average as adults, which is really no bigger than a corn snake. So for example, this Suriname red tail, this guy is a fully grown adult male. He's about six feet long. Uh, he's a 2016 baby, so he's, uh, what, seven years old now. Has already sired at least one litter, maybe a second one. And uh, this is a pretty much normal size, you know, about, about six feet for an adult male, true red tail. Yes, they can be a lot bigger, but that's very rare, especially in captivity. Typically, they get at the most to be about eight feet. And, you know, the largest of my true red tail females is about eight feet right now. Um, they're just not that big of a snake. In fact, when you see on these videos, the size of the snake is somewhat exaggerated because I'm using a wide angle lens to film them and I'm holding them close to the lens. Okay, so you get some kind of distortion where the objects close to the lens are look disproportionately large, you know? So the actual size of the animals might be even magnified somewhat. When I hold them closer to me, the effect is reduced. So these animals just are not that big. Uh, I'm not that big of a guy, okay. I have a hard time identifying jungle if it's not blatantly obvious. And this is more of a comment. And yes, jungle is a hard morph to understand. Um, jungle has somewhat like six or seven different characteristics that make a jungle a jungle. But the confusing thing is that not every jungle has all these characteristics. In fact, almost none of the jungles will have all the characteristics of the jungle. Sometimes they'll only have like two or three of the characteristics. And there are many other types of boas that have the same characteristics as a jungle, but they're not jungles. And it's really confusing. And in fact, I did a video entitled The Enigmatic Jungle Boa. Um, one of my earliest videos I made where I went over these different characteristics and showed examples. So check out that video if you want more information on what makes a jungle boa a jungle boa. Okay, one more question. Uh, I thought boas were more of a square-shaped girth 
but she, meaning the boa in the video, looks more round. Is the camera the reason or are they more round? Well, the girth of the boa varies by the type of boa, the age of the boa, and whether it has just fed. So, in general, healthy boas are more of a square shape than a round shape, especially for the true red tails like the Suriname. This guy's nice and square. In cross section, his body is kind of like a loaf of bread, uh, and not round at all. However, other types of boas, while they should be more of a square than round, they're definitely going to be more on the round uh, end, you know, round side compared to the true red tail. Many of the boa imperators and some of the other types of morph boas, for example. And then if a boa has just eaten, it's obviously going to be more round than if it's been, you know, a week or two since it ate. And I think with that particular video, one of the boas had eaten just a few days before and so it was quite round. So in general, I try not to use boas in my videos which I've eaten recently, but sometimes I just need to have a specific boa to make a certain point. And so sometimes they will have more of a round appearance because they've recently eaten. And I think with that particular example, the boa had just eaten like a double extra large rat. So it definitely showed more of a round shape in part of its body, um, which was why it looked more round. I think it was also an Argentine boa, which they tend to be a little more round than these true red tails. Um, but yeah, some boas are more round at certain times than others. Okay, I think that's enough questions for today. Um, thanks all for the questions. Please keep them coming and I'll do more videos like this in the future. Hope you guys got some value by watching this video. Thanks for staying to the end. Shoot me any more comments or questions you have and enjoy your boas.